For some reason, the internet is flooded with videos titled How I Would Learn to Code If I Could Start Over. All these videos literally have the exact same title. It seems to be a requirement for every coding YouTuber to make one of these. Regardless, no one made a video like this for engineering, specifically engineering that involves more mechanical or hardware work, so that's where your boy comes in. There are two main important aspects to consider when learning engineering from scratch. First, there's the material you need to know. Second, there's a job hunting strategy you can follow to actually help you get a high paying engineering job when you're starting out with no experience. I should mention though that you can probably get a job coding without ever going to university or college, but you can't really, at least at this moment in time, get an engineering job without going to university. So I should mention that. That being said, we can look at the engineering curriculum taught in school and see what are the most important courses or topics that are really useful when it comes to building things. Because to be honest, just between you and me, there are a lot of not so useful courses in engineering. If you're trying to build something, you don't need to integrate really complicated integrals or no one at your job will ask you to solve partial differential equations. Anyways, the useful material can be broken down into two categories, the theoretical and practical. Under the theoretical section, there are six main topics we need to understand. Mechanics of deformable solids or mods for short, material science, manufacturing, heat transfer, GD&T, and analysis of failure. Under the practical section, there are four main topics you need to be familiar with. CADing, rapid prototyping, Arduino, as well as hand and shop tools. The material and skills I just mentioned aren't very useful if you aren't applying them using a good job hunting strategy. The last thing you want is to spend so much time, effort, and money into learning these confusing engineering concepts and then end up not even getting your dream job. The job hunting strategy in engineering can be broken down into three stages. Let's say this is you and you have absolutely no experience, negative experience even. In stage one, you want to apply to internships for tiny, tiny startups. These are very small early stage startups that can't really afford to hire full-time engineers just yet, so they'll have to settle for interns and they'll pay them kind of low. But that's a good thing for you because it gives you the chance to build some real world experience. I legit did this myself in my undergrad. I worked for startups like Access Labs, Helpware, and Valadir that were all pretty small at the time. These small startups don't really feel corporate at all. Working there kind of feels like you're working on a school project with some friends. In stage two, you want to apply to internships at corporate companies. I did this when I worked for Ecobee and had a lot of my friends work for companies like Toyota and Magna. Using your experience from stage one, you should be able to land a corporate company internship, which will honestly look pretty good on your resume. In stage three, you want to apply to internships for tech companies. I did this when I worked for Tesla. Using your experience from stage two, you should have enough engineering knowledge at this point to pass the hard technical interviews that these tech companies tend to ask. This is the exact job hunting strategy I did through my undergrad where I started with easier, lower paying startups and then worked my way up to tech companies. Also, when you're applying to engineering jobs, kind of narrow down what kind of engineering job you want, whether it's design engineering, manufacturing engineering, firmware engineering, just have an idea instead of just applying to every single role that has an engineering title next to it. Anyways, now that we have a solid job hunting strategy lined up, let's look at the engineering engineering material that you'd need to know in more detail. I don't want to bore you, so I'm going to keep this part quite high level. But before getting into it, let me say this. If you fully understand and can apply the material I'm about to talk about, then you might just be qualified for a design engineering role at Apple or Tesla, at least for an internship or junior position. Anyways, the first topic under the theoretical category is mods. Here, we need to understand beam bending and become familiar with the flexure formula equation as well as the cantilevered beam equation. You see, when you have a part that's under bending like this, there's an equation that represents the stress acting on this part, which is the flexure formula. Sigma equals negative my over i. Sigma is the bending stress and is represented by these red arrows. M is the moment acting on the part and I is the moment of inertia. And Y would be the distance from the neutral axis. If you rotate this part and see that it has a rectangular cross section, there's an equation for the moment of inertia that we can use, which is I equals BH cubed over 12. B is the base dimension and H is the height dimension. Great, now we just covered the flexure formula. The other important equation is the cantilevered beam equation, which is delta equals FL cubed over 3EI. Let's break down this equation. A beam is just a long and sturdy piece of material like metal or wood. And a cantilever beam is one that's fixed on one end while free to move on the other end, just like this. F is the force acting here, L is this length, E means Young's modulus, which is a material property that tells us how easy it is to basically stretch a material. 
And I is the moment of inertia, which is the same moment of inertia we had in the flexure formula equation earlier. In engineering, we absolutely love equations. So if there's one equation you remember from this video, it should be this one because it gets asked in almost every hardware engineering interview. For example, an Apple hiring manager can ask you, let's say I place a stop sign at the end of a cantilevered beam. What can we do to minimize that beam's deflection? So if you understand the cantilever beam equation, you should be able to answer this question, no problem. I can continue talking about MOS for longer, but if I did, this video will be hours long. So let's move on and talk about material science. The most important thing about material science from a mechanical or hardware engineering point of view is a stress strain curve. Stress refers to the force being applied per area and strain refers to how much a part is being deformed or stretched. If we take a piece of material and stretch it by applying a uniform amount of stress, then how much it stretches before it breaks can be explained using this diagram. In an engineering interview, you can be asked to draw this diagram, so it's important to be familiar with it and all the important points on it. This point right here before the line starts curving is called the yield strength. It divides the graph into two parts. The first part is where we have elastic deformation, which means if I stretch the part at a stress level below the yield strength and let go, it comes back to its original position. But if I apply stress higher than the yield strength, the deformation would become permanent. The slope of this linear portion in the elastic region is the Young's modulus, E, which is the same variable as the one we had in the cantilever beam equation. See, everything's connected. This point is the ultimate tensile strength, which is the maximum strength a material can handle before breaking. Finally, this point represents the stress needed to cause the material to break, called the fracture point. Every material will have a unique stress strain curve. Materials that are more ductile or flexible will have a stress strain curve that looks like this, while a brittle material like ceramics would look like that. Also, as engineers, we interface a lot with metals, so it's important to understand the difference between the two most common types of metals we use, steel and aluminum. When comparing them, this right here is a list of some of the most common comparisons between the two. Again, this is just a high level explanation of the topic because there is way more detail that I can go into, but I'll end it here for now because we need to move on and talk about manufacturing. To make parts at high volume, engineers can use a bunch of different manufacturing methods. The three most popular ones are injection molding, machining, and sheet metal forming. Injection molding is when you take little plastic pellets and feed it into a hopper. Then a large screw rotates to push these pellets forward. As they're being pushed, they melt. By the time they're at the front, they're fully molten and get pushed into a cavity. It then cools and the plastic becomes a solid and boom, you just made a new plastic part. The mold opens and the part falls out, then the mold closes and we begin the process all over again. Moving on, usually in manufacturing we have processes that are either additive or subtractive. If we're manufacturing something by adding material, it's additive, and if we're manufacturing something by removing material, it's subtractive. Machining, for example, is a subtractive manufacturing process. That's because in this process, we can take a large piece of material like metal and remove the unwanted material from it to create the shape that we want. Next, sheet metal forming is when you take a big sheet of metal and you apply a force on it to permanently deform it into the shape you want. You can't make crazy geometry with this manufacturing process, but it is pretty useful when it comes to making enclosures, for example. Another important topic under manufacturing would be DFM, which stands for Design for Manufacturing. To use one of the manufacturing processes I just mentioned, there are a few rules of thumb we need to keep in mind when designing to make sure the part can actually be manufactured. For example, if we plan to injection mold a part, when designing it, we must make sure we have constant wall thickness, round edges or corners, as well as draft angles. Moving on, let's discuss heat transfer. You don't need to stress yourself too much with some of the more complicated equations. For now, just start off by understanding the three main methods or modes of heat transfer, conduction, convection, and radiation. Conduction is when you have heat moving through a material and it's represented by this equation. Q represents the heat transferred, K is the thermal conductivity, it's a material property that represents a material's ability to conduct heat, T1 is the temperature on one side and T2 is the temperature on the other, and L is the distance between them. Convection is when heat is transferred from a surface to a moving fluid, like how a hot cup of coffee gets colder and it transfers heat from it to its surrounding air. It can be represented by this equation where Q represents the heat transferred, H is the convective heat transfer coefficient and it's a material property, A is the surface area and this represents the change in temperature. Finally, radiation happens when an object releases electromagnetic waves to heat its surroundings. The sun heating the earth or a bonfire heating the people around it are some common examples. It's represented by this equation where epsilon is emissivity and it's just a material property of the surface releasing the electromagnetic waves. 
Sigma is the Stefan Boltzmann constant, which is this ugly number. TS is the temperature of the surface, and T sur is the temperature of its surroundings. And obviously Q represents the heat transferred. Next, let's talk about GDNT. When we're creating engineering drawings, I can't just tell the people manufacturing my design to make this part 8 inches long. That's just not enough information. I usually need to provide some geometric characteristics and that's usually done with symbols, 14 symbols to be exact. These symbols can tell the manufacturer more information on how the form, orientation, and location of a part needs to be, like how straight or how cylindrical this part must be. For example, if I use this symbol to define how cylindrical a part is, it means that if I were to draw two circles and set the distance between them to be 0.25 millimeters, the final manufactured circle must be in this region, so the circle can look like this. Now when we're building stuff, things usually don't go as expected, so there's a whole world of root cause analysis methods that we can use to predict failure and ideally prevent it. One of my favorite ways is by creating a DFMEA, which stands for Design, Failure Modes, and Effects Analysis. Let's look at this Apple Pencil for example and create a DFMEA chart for it. We start off by listing the function of this product, and let's say one function would be digital note taking. Next, we put in the design requirement to fulfill this function, which would be to deliver digital ink and ensure pencil runs smoothly. Next, we need to write in some potential failures and their effects. Pencil running out of battery is one failure mode, and the effect would be no digital ink available. Another failure could be pen tip gets deformed, and the effect would be pen malfunction. For both of these failures, we need to assess how severe it is on a scale from 1 to 10. Then, we fill in what could potentially be causing these failures, like not charging the battery long enough, or applying too much pressure when writing with the pencil. Afterwards, we fill in how likely it is for this failure to occur on a scale from 1 to 10, as well as what we're doing to prevent these failures and how we plan to detect them. Afterwards, on a scale of 1 to 10, we input how difficult it is to actually detect this failure. We then take the number for severity, occurrence, and detection, multiply them together to get the risk priority number, or RPN for short. This represents the overall risk of a particular failure. Finally, we end off this chart with the action recommended moving forward. This is again just one way to help us engineers prepare for failure. Other common diagrams include the fishbone diagram, five Ys, etc. Now let's move on and talk about some practical skills. Catting is a skill that can honestly make you employable. So learning how to use CAD software like SOLIDWORKS, Onshape, Fusion 360, Inventor, or FreeCAD is really important. Literally just pick whatever software you have access to, then go to YouTube and find some tutorials that'll teach you how to use that software. Start off by learning how to extrude, cut, loft, revolve, etc. Then you can move on to more complicated things like sheet metal design, weldment design, or even surface design. Moving on, when you cat something and you want to turn it into a real life object, we need to quickly prototype it. And that can be done in one of two ways, usually 3D printing or laser cutting. Laser cutting works great if we're making a prototyping enclosure or just need a quick 2D design. Whereas a 3D printer would work better for more complicated 3D geometry. The three most common types of 3D printing are SLA, SLS, and FDM. Now moving on, usually to make things move efficiently and on their own, we need to have electronics involved. We definitely don't need to go overboard and design our own PCBs, but a good starting point is to become comfortable using an Arduino. Being able to use one and becoming more familiar with things like breadboards, wires, LEDs, motors, etc. can go a long way. Now regardless of what kind of engineering you're in, even software, I think it's pretty important for everyone to be familiar with using hand tools. This includes things like calipers, screwdrivers, hammers, allen keys, clamps, drills, sanders, etc. It just gives you the ability to be able to build things in real life. It also doesn't hurt to gain some exposure to shop tools. That includes things like drill presses, the burning machines, lathes, milling machines, band saws, belt sanders, and cheap metal equipment. Now these tools can just help take a prototype that you're working on or a product that you're trying to make and help it look more professional instead of a hobbyist 8th grade project. To summarize, if I was forced to study engineering all over again, I'd first develop a good job hunting strategy broken down into these three stages. To get qualified for these jobs, I'd start studying these theoretical courses and subjects as well as become familiar with these practical concepts. Anyways, I hope this video brought you value. If it did, check out this video where I share with you a day in my life as a mechanical design engineer or check out that video where I share with you the career levels in engineering. Anyways, I'll see you in the next one. Peace!